Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Hot Topics 2021 uh, Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the Director of the Environmental Law Center and Associate Dean for Environmental Programs. And we're very pleased to welcome you all to our online presentation today. Each of the talks in the Hot Topics series is worth one Vermont CLE credit. So if you'd like to get that credit, please keep track of which talks you attend for your records. We'll have time for Q&A after the presentation today, but you can type your question into the chat at any point during the lecture. So please don't hesitate to do that. And we'll get to as many as we can in the remaining time after our speaker concludes their remarks. Today, we are very pleased to welcome BLS professor Pamela Besseland. Professor Besselin is an assistant professor at BLS um, and teaches civil procedure one and two, administrative law, professional law, and courses in animal law. Sorry, professional responsibility. Um, she joined the BLS faculty in 2018. And before that, she practiced animal law in North Carolina, where she represented individuals and nonprofit organizations and focused on the legal needs of pet owners in underserved communities. She received her JD cum laude from BLS, after which she clerked for the Vermont trial courts and earned an LLM with honors in food and agriculture law at the University of Arkansas School of Law. Her research and scholarship focuses on industrial animal production and the constitutional implications of regulating animal treatment at both the federal and state levels. Today, P Professor Veslin will present a talk titled The CAFO Version 2 Alternative Reality. Okay. Um, sorry, I'll say that again. Her, her talk. I'm not sure where the feedback is coming from. Uh, Professor, would you mind muting for a moment and see if that does it? Okay. Um, the talk today is titled The CAFO Version 2 Alternate Realities in Administrative Law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pamela Vesta. Thank you, Dean Rushlow. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, normally, I do the hot topic in person. Uh, and uh, I see all uh, those of you getting your CLE credits. Uh, and uh, I hope you are doing well on the other side of the divide here. Uh, as Dean Rushlow said, my um, topic today is uh, entitled The CAFO Version 2.0 Alternate Realities in Administrative Law. To base this, uh, this title on a concept that uh, I put to you as um, uh, the beginning of the story, and that is that the CAFO model as we know it today um, has taken economic efficiency about as far as it can go. Um, stunning advancements though in genetic engineering offer us at this point, two distinctly different possible futures for CAFO agriculture. On the one hand, one possible future for CAFO agriculture uses intentional genomic alteration or genetic, uh, genetic engineering to manipulate and select for traits at the animal's genetic level. IGA can be used to uh, extend input output efficiencies beyond the limits of selective breeding, um, or uh, it might be used to uh, breed animals that meet specific customer or consumer preferences or medical needs, <clears throat> perhaps even allergies. Uh, or they might be engineered to mitigate uh, well-known environmental impacts, um, such as the emission of uh, methane from dairy cattle. The alternative, however, uh, of CAFO 2.0 draws on, although it draws on related genetic engineering technologies, produces a completely different model. And that is one that uses cellular agriculture, cellular reproduction technologies to produce animal end products, but not the animals themselves. What am I talking about? Lab cultured meat. Cultured meat, 
um, synthetic meat, anything, whatever, uh, it goes by many names, but um, I'll probably refer to it mostly as cultured meat. This is technically grown from, uh, from a cell in a process that I'm gonna briefly touch on in a few minutes, um, but it essentially creates the end product without going through the process of birth through slaughter stages um, of live animals or any of the externalities or most of the externalities associated with them. So that's a big choice. And the choice between these two futures really lies with the administrative state where the USDA and the FDA as a division of HHS, Health and Human Services, are basically engaged in, for the most part, a regulatory turf war um, that is aggravated a bit by what I would say potentially dubious congressional authority um, and certainly um, unclear executive policy direction. So these are what I want to talk about today uh, and um, kind of ask some questions at the end of, of things to think about um, as we move forward. So why do I say the CAFO as we know it today is basically tapped out and it's about as efficient as it's going to get? Well, think about where we get, for the most part, meat, poultry, eggs, dairy, um, from upwards of 90% to 98% are produced by horizontally consolidated, vertically integrated, small handful of producers that breed and raise, slaughter and process uh, almost all of the meat, uh, dairy and eggs sold in the United States. They have a, a almost complete monopoly and monopsony and antitrust laws have at least to this point not been, um, not been used to address that. A big secret, or not a big secret, a big cornerstone really, uh, uh, one of the secrets of success for the CAFO um, is minimized input costs. By input costs, I mean the amount of land, feed, water, labor, expenses that are used to produce uh, meat and dairy. Because of high density confinement of animals on a CAFO, uh, they, the animals themselves require less land, obviously, feed and water, and it takes fewer people to take care of them. Now, consumers and uh, animal welfare advocates, public safety, public uh, food safety advocates have been pushing back uh, for various reasons on some of the most confining practices like battery cages for egg laying hens and gestation crates for breeding cells. So there is some, there that resistance um, actually that's one way that the this CAFO model has really met its end. But another cornerstone, and one that doesn't get as much press, is the advanced selective breeding practices. That is the creation of very specific breeds that have certain traits, traits like a certain amount of uh, white meat um, on broiler chickens versus dark meat. Uh, so qualities of meat, size of eggs, size of a litter, so re that's reproductive um, traits. Today's cows and pigs and chickens, et cetera, grow larger more rapidly and convert feed to energy um, more efficiently than uh, any, anything that even closely resembles the types of uh, the versions of these animals of 50 to 75 years ago. Um, and they're also supplemented with various pharmaceuticals, Many, um, most of them uh, either unregulated or uh, as far as dispens dispensation goes, but, um, but certainly under-regulated. Just some examples of what do I mean. Um, specialized breeds, these are uh, closely guarded intellectual secrets belonging to the um, producers. Nearly all of our milk today comes from cows that produce three times as much milk per year as cows of 80 years ago. Chickens that are bred for meat, often referred to as broilers, they grow twice as large in half the time uh, it took to reach maturity in 1925, so nearly 100 years ago. For some perspective of what that type of rapid growth means, if you grew that fast as one of these birds, by the time you were two years old, you'd be 350 pounds. 
So think about your two-year-old skeleton bearing that much weight. Egg-laying hens today have been selectively bred to produce. Now the, the, the standard is, I'll say on average, 280 eggs. Some of them boast as much as 300 eggs a year. But egg-laying hens initially lay somewhere around 15 eggs a year. So we're talking about a 20, time, uh, 20 times uh, increase in egg production. Despite these radical changes in animal productivity that have been available to uh, selective breeders, traditional breeding methods haven't really done much to mitigate animal suffering. Although, as sort of an anecdote, um, there have been producers that have tried to claim this. Uh, back in the early 2000s, Smithfield claimed, Smithfield Farms claimed that it had isolated and eliminated what it called the stress gene in hogs, um, with the result being that Smithfield hogs suffered less stress than hogs raised by their competitors. Uh, this, is, this story is told in uh, Matthew Scully's excellent book, Dominion, uh, that was published in the in the early 2000s. Of course, that's pure nonsense. Um, not that it isn't possible today necessarily, but it certainly wasn't verified. Now, is it verifiable? Potentially. Um, ethologists, those who study animal behavior, might be able to support or refute this type of uh, claim with animal studies, but that was just, that claim was nonsense. The reality is that uh, Breeding for conformity and productivity has led to chronic suffering from excessive burden on the animal's metabolisms, their internal organs, and their skeletal systems. Um, and uh, the result is, for example, uh, dairy cows, because they um, are producing offspring every 12 to 15 months and being milked nine months of the year, uh, by the time that they are past their height of productivity and sent to slaughter, many of them uh, have depleted calcium. Um, they suffer from osteoporosis and other uh, stressors on their skeletal systems. And this is really where you hear about downer cattle or lame cattle uh, that go to slaughter and have are unable to stand up or walk on their own when they reach slaughter. Uh, so. That's just one example um, of how animal welfare has suffered due to selective breeding. Now, selective breeding hasn't also been, hasn't, much hasn't been done to address the considerable and mounting environmental and public health externalities of mass animal confinement either. Although some advances have been made as it relates to uh, pharmaceuticals and, and um, combinations of foods that are, that are uh, um, fed to farmed animals. So we're tapped out on efficiency, that is production yield, um, using the technologies that we have, um, but the environmentalists and animal advocates still aren't happy. So if this is the end of the line for CAFO 1.0, here's, we've got this choice, as I mentioned at the beginning of what's next. So we're turning to door number one, genetic engineering. This is not selective breeding. Right? Selective breeding is you take two animals that have traits that that you uh, um, that you would prefer to um, to carry on, and you and you breed that way. Genetic engineering is actually the intentional invasive disruption of the normal gene sequence at the molecular level. Um, and then there's uh, another type of uh, of animal produced using genetic engineering called transgenesis. This is the introduction of foreign genetic material, say from another animal or uh, bacteria um, to alter the traits of the animal. The traits that are selected for in the genetic engineering process, at least the ones that we've seen so far, are of course, as you would expect, market-driven. Uh, they respond to the demands of producers, first for traits that have economic impacts or perhaps to um, mitigate um, costs of uh, regulations. So some examples. This has been around for a while, this genetic engineering of farmed animals. That is, when I say been around, I mean that scientists have been 
uh, exploring this and uh, attempting to uh, create the ideal uh, breed of certain farmed animals really internationally. So um, in Seoul, Korea, for example, um, scientists produced a GE strain of pig that had twice as much muscle as regular pigs. So the pork that was produced was higher in protein, lower in fat. And if you Google this, you'll actually see these pictures. It is bizarre to see a pig that's ripped, really, has muscles that you can see. Uh, a similar double muscle trait was developed in um, a breed of cow called the Belgian Blue um, by selecting for a genetic defect that creates extra muscle. Um, of course, this is not without its issues. The calves born of Belgian Blues, they're so large that they actually require cesarean births. They can't be uh, born naturally. Cows, um, that is dairy and, and cows bred for meat, they are, of course, significant producers of uh, the greenhouse gas methane. Um, studies in the UK and in the University of Alberta, Canada, which is not coincidentally the largest beef production uh, region in North America, or one of the largest, um, as well as the USDA Agricultural Research Service, um, continue to fund research projects related to um, breeding animals that uh, emit less methane that uh, basically um, addresses the amount of methane that is released during their digestion process. And then finally, there was a there was another study in Canada known as the Enviro pig. It no longer exists today, but this transgenic pig uh, was bred to address um, the uh, phosphorus that is in hog farm waste. Um, that's a major contributor to algal blooms um, and uh, is initially was developed um, by scientists at the University of Guelph as a way to um, mitigate damage to local water bodies. Used genetic material from a mouse and E. coli bacterium. Um, it was successful in terms of, it actually created a pig that actually did do that. Um, it digested more of the phosphorus, less of it was released in the pig's waste. We'll return to the Enviro pig in just a few minutes. Now, in the U.S., you are probably aware of or have heard of the Aqua Advantage salmon. This was um, first actually developed as far back as 1989 um, by a company, a company that goes by the name Aqua Bounty. Um, the FDA actually approved of the development and sale of Aqua Vantage. This is genetically engineered salmon. This is transgenic, actually. It uses um, a coding sequence from um, uh, a Chinook salmon, and I'm not going to get into the, the actual genetic engineering of it, uh, but it, it is, um, it is, it is, is developed to grow, again, at, like broiler chickens, um, almost twice as large in half the time. This is, of course, for uh, for marine-based or it's, a, it's basically water-based CAFO production of salmon, so farmed salmon. Now, just because the FDA approved it doesn't mean that it is available today. It has been the subject of uh, over a decade of litigation and um, its latest uh, status is still, or it's ultimately what will happen to it is unknown. And I'll return to that as well. Uh, and most recently in December of just this past year, uh, the FDA approved an IGA pig called the GALSAFE pig. That's G-A-L-S-A-F-E. It's got the word safe in the title, so it must be safe, right? Uh, it's um, the, this type of pig was, or this um, breed of pig was approved for both human consumption as well as the development of human therapeutics. Um, and uh, that is, as far as the human consumption and why it was developed, um, it was, perhaps you've heard of this um, mysterious allergy to meat that is occurring in some of the southern states 
it's been linked to a certain a bite from a certain tick. But when somebody develops this allergy, they really can no longer eat red meat, beef, pork, and lamb. And so this gal safe pig has been developed uh, so that people who have mild or severe allergic reactions to what's known as this alpha gal sugar that's in red meat, um, this pig does not develop that, and so it can be consumed by people with this allergy. Talk about reacting to uh, uh, market needs. Um, now, GE, uh, genetically engineered animals, um, could also be developed to eliminate or mitigate production diseases that come from high density confinement of genetically uh, conformed species. So, when you have a whole lot of animals that are genetically um, in conformance with one another, when one of them gets sick, the entire herd usually gets the same thing. Um, and so the risk of uh, infectious diseases running through um, a facility of you know, thousands of animals is, is high. Um, when all, uh, well, for example, the uh, since the 1980s, um, there's been uh, a, an illness that goes by the acronym PRRSV, that's, it's porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. This virus in the past, over the past decade has just uh, decimated the pork industry. It's basically a virus that little piglets get. And once it has infiltrated um, a, a facility overnight, there'll be mass deaths because these, these piglets just basically um, aren't able to retain water. And there's no vaccine for it. And they and, and scientists have been working for madly for years to come up with some way to address it. Well, turns out that intentional genomic alteration seems to be offering a, a potential solution to that. Obviously, the industry is hot to get that approved. It's also possible that genetic engineering could be used to address some welfare concerns. Uh, that is like uh, breeding dairy cows that don't have horns, so they don't have to be dehorned or aren't dehorned. Um, or, for example, um, sex selection, such as dairy cows being bred so that they will only produce female calves and not male calves. Male calves are unnecessary uh, to the dairy um, process, dairy production process. So um, do that uh, as well as um, egg laying breeders have hens lay only female chicks as opposed to male chicks. Again, male chicks are, uh, are um, unnecessary in the egg laying production process. So the sky's the limit, right? Let's look at door number two now, the cellular meat. This is the this is um, obviously a very different type of CAFO. Lab-based or, or uh, grown meat products are actually not grown on a farm at all, but in a bioreactor. Today, there are a number of com companies um, in the tens, I would say over 20 companies that are actively um, funded and um, developing beef, pork, chicken, tuna, salmon, even eggs, and uh, very recent technologies um, in stem cell uh, biotechnology has been able to, um, has really made this a possible substitute to animal production for these products. Um, whether it's cultured meat or use of um, CRISPR technologies, basically what happens is that uh, a cell in an animal is isolated, nutrients are added to it, and reproduction or proliferation occurs. It's an extremely sensitive process. It's extremely expensive. Um, the very first proof of concept was uh, served in London in 2013 for uh, the, the um, ticket price of $330,000. The prices come way down on that, and the, the process is actually something that could very well be a scalable option.
uh, for production of meat. In fact, Singapore was the first nation to formally approve cultured meat uh, and began serving it uh, just a few months ago. It sees the development of cultured meat as a way that the country can actually begin to uh, uh, rely, uh, create its own food supply. Right now it imports more than 90% of the food consumed in Singapore. And so it's developed this, this program called 30 by 30 initiative um, that it, it intends to produce 30% of its own food domestically by the year 2030. The upside environmentally of cellular agriculture is pretty obvious. Uh, studies show that um, depending on what we're, you know, what is being developed environmentally, the production can uh, use seven to 45% less energy. Uh, the uh, emission of greenhouse gases is anywhere between 78% and 96% uh, emissions. And of course, land use is also um, minimized to something like 1% of the land used for current CAFO uh, agriculture. Um, now, depending on what technology is being used for the initial biopsy or create, uh, use, uh, development of the, of the cell and um, what is grown in the lab, it may be extracted from a live animal, so animal welfare would not be completely eliminated as a concern, but compared to the nine and a half billion animals that are uh, raised and slaughtered for food in this country every year, it's, it's really no comparison at all. So, wow, we could go in either direction. Um, and the science is certainly getting us there pretty quickly. There's that uh, maxim in law school that, that the law always is at least a decade behind science, and I'd say it's well beyond that. Uh, the question really of the adoption or the choice, do we, do we throw our eggs in the basket? Sorry about that. Um, that is using genetic engineering to create animals that address some of our environmental concerns, perhaps even our animal welfare concerns, maybe we can find the stress gene, or do we, should we be looking to eliminate the animal agriculture industry as we know it altogether? Uh, can they both occur? Uh, that choice, which way we go, what, what shapes the next version of animal agriculture um, depends on uh, an, a number of factors. And by the way, if you're interested in cellular agriculture, I, I commend to you um, an excellent article by Brian Sylvester, as in Sylvester the Cat, and other authors uh, from um, the Kentucky Journal of Equine uh, and Justice Law from 2020. Um, it's called From Petri Dish to Main Dish. Um, and so that, that article does a really nice job of laying out the, not only the regulatory concerns, but um, the, some of the adoption concerns for cultured meat. But I'm going to narrow this down and do a little comparison of a couple of different factors. First of all, Obviously, if we're going, if, if, if cultured meat or genetically modified animal products are going to be sold for human consumption in the United States, there must be some type of uh, regulation, right? Well, yes, their food and ag law will come into play here. Um, and there are two primary agencies that have either asserted authority or uh, um, are in dispute over it. Uh, I will say first that this is not an original opinion, but our food and ag law system is not ready for either of these technologies. Um, anybody familiar with food law knows that already we have a fractured system in which the USDA and the FDA, a division of HHS, are uh, 
it, working um, sometimes together, uh, but they, there's a division of regulation over the production and sale and transport and labeling of, of food. Um, we can put it in pretty uh, basic terms by saying that the USDA is essentially tasked with uh, the um, slaughter and processing and sale to point of purchase of products that are strictly livestock, meat, poultry, um, and it shares responsibility for eggs. And so, so derived from um, the animal whole, that would be more USDA. Uh, there are two main federal laws in play here. That's the Federal Meat Inspection Act at 21 U.S.C. 601 and the Poultry Products Inspection Act at 21 U.S.C. 451. These laws are not so much uh, laws that, that deal with the animals as they are alive, but the, the results of the slaughter process. Um, and so it's, these are mostly food laws. Uh, they have, um, there's inspection um, of processing facilities, it's a big part of it, as well as accuracy of labeling. Right. So that's the USDA. Um, the inspection part of USDA for federal meat inspection and poultry products inspection is called the, uh, the FSIS, um, Food Safety Inspection Service. This is a division of USDA. This agency uh, is tasked with, they're at the slaughterhouses, they are inspecting um, the meat processing uh, as it goes. And, and, um, and they have a role to play, at least as the USDA asserts, in the cultured meat process. Um, same applies for the Poultry Products Inspection Act. The, another a division or another agency in USDA, APHIS, that's A-P-H-I-S, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, that uh, has been traditionally the agency that's taken the lead on approving the use of or the introduction of genetically engineered plants or crops uh, for human consumption. So, Traditionally, APHIS of USDA has been the one that spearheaded um, the, the uh, work to approve of the use of, say, um, uh, a soybean that is um, resistant to uh, Roundup, but is, uh, sorry, Roundup ready is what I'm trying to say, soybeans, for example. Um, now, that's not, APHIS is not actually uh, apparently going to be the section of the USDA that is in charge of or has authority over um, genetically engineered animals. Instead, the FDA has claimed authority over genetically engineered animals. And this was somewhat of a controversial move uh, back in the early 2000s. The FDA, of course, it's its main um, statute that it uh, that it enforces is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. One section of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is the Animal Drug section, and that's at 21 USC 360B. That's little b. And uh, the Animal Drug section of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is the part of the of the law that um, the FDA, in which the FDA approves the use of certain ph pharmaceuticals in the for animal use, whether it's an agricultural production or uh, treatment of animals, say that you know a veterinarian would prescribe um, in treating your dog, for example. Uh, but the definition of drug in that in 360B is read by the FDA to mean that it also covers the process of genetic alteration. So the FDA basically asserted itself as the agency that was charged with or that had the authority 
to be um, to lead the process of approving or denying applications for uh, genetically engineered animals, um, whether it's for therapeutic health or therapeutic or food consumption. The USDA did not take kindly to that, nor did a, a number of um, food safety, consumer safety, public health, and animal welfare advocates. And so when the FDA first asserted this authority, it did so as it applied to that uh, aqua bounty, uh, aqua advantage salmon, the transgenic salmon that uh, I said um, grew so much faster and, and had been the subject of so much litigation. Um, the, that first challenge uh, in, was challenging the FDA's authority to actually regulate uh, GE animals under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The, ultimately, it won that case, or at least has won it, at least it would seem, um, a Northern District of California judge ruled uh, that, the, um, that the FDA indeed squarely has the authority to lead the charge on approving GE animals. Uh, still, this now, the initial approval was in 2015. In 2019, the court said that the court affirmed the, uh, the FDA's authority, and yet still you can't buy aqua advantage salmon. Uh, and that is because um, uh, it, well, it's gone through multiple uh, um, additional challenges in court, um, as well as uh, there being um, uncertainty about how to label it. And Congress has had to, has at least attempted to step in and uh, and decide how to label genetically engineered animal food products. But right now, why you don't have aqua vantage salmon on your table or at your store is that the same court in California um, uh, granted partial summary judgment for the challengers, which includes which includes Center for Soup food safety and the Institute for Fisheries Resources um, in a case that challenged the FDA's uh, acts under NEPA. That is, did the FDA take a hard look at what the risks were for fish farming a transgenic salmon when it could get loose or, or be released in some way to, uh, to some external body of water and then uh, breed, say, with other salmon, what would be the effect of that? Now, the FDA didn't conduct an, uh, or, or at, have uh, Aqua Bounty conduct an environmental impact statement. And so right now, the court essentially has directed the FDA to go back and correct for that. So, so there you've got um, uh, some of the legal challenges for um, genetically engineered animal products. It's not just going to be um, uh, getting approval for the food safety, the, the, the safety for human consumption. There's also the environmental aspects, and NEPA is going to play a large role in that. I should say that in uh, I would, one of the last days of the Trump administration, former Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue, on the way out the door, signed a memorandum of understanding with the assistant secretary of health and human services, not the secretary, not the administrator of the FDA who refused to sign it, signed a memorandum of understanding saying that the FDA would transfer a great deal of its, uh, its authority to the USDA in order to speed up approval of GE animals like the pigs that can combat um, or, or resist uh, viruses. So right now there is there is some dispute about who's about the which agency has regulatory authority uh, where that stands. Now I uh, if you're interested in this I would Google uh, Center for Food Safety, ALDF, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, letter, IGA animals, something like that. And you'll pull up on the on the Center for Food Safety site um, and 13 or so uh, 
groups got together and wrote letters to the secretaries of HHS and Secretary Vilsack at USDA, uh, urging them to take a look at this to 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 take a look at this situation and to dissolve that memorandum of understanding and have the FDA resume its authority because it it alone has the uh, at least it has more incentive statutorily and, and it has the uh, experience to um, insist on more testing for uh, the safety of these animals, not just the animals as uh, for use for human consumption, but the animals themselves. So trying to wrap it up with some of the other concerns, the whole regulatory process um, is one issue. Now, the USDA and the FDA have actually come to a, a, an understanding when it comes to cultured meat. Um, they have signed a, a formal agreement that basically says, here's these are the different responsibilities that each of the agencies will take in the development of it. The question to me, though, is <clears throat> not how will the different agencies regulate, but how will they be championing it or who will champion it? If you think about the USDA and you think about, especially Secretary Vilsack, we've seen him before. He was the Secretary of Agriculture under the Obama administration. Not, and while he was away during the Trump administration, he uh, headed up a, um, a lobbying group for the dairy, uh, dairy industry. This is, this is somebody who um, has a, a long background in industrial animal agriculture. There is, uh, there. This is the. This is what USDA does. It promotes and supports traditional, conventional producers. Is it going to be able to? Will it have the political will to mount the kind of effort that it's going to take to promulgate regulations, to uh, conduct studies? Uh, dispense research and development funds in furtherance of cultured meat as opposed to uh, genetically altered meat. Um, the, the USDA has spent a fair amount of, of its uh, of money on in supporting the development of the genetically engineered side of, of the um, of the alternate realities. On the cultured meat side, there are numerous investors, including some big names like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Richard Branson, all very supportive of companies that are um, developing cultured meats. Um, in addition to uh, the, the potential, or not potential, likely years of litigation that could take place for either of these, um, the introduction of either of these uh, technologies large scale. Um, there's also the question of, uh, and a, a related question of labeling. How will it be labeled? Furthermore, how will consumers accept it? Who's going to eat this stuff? Now, I think for the, the cultured meat question is really the more interesting of the two. Uh, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, you already perhaps are eating plant-based food, uh, you know, meat substitutes, or maybe not at all. Uh, you may have noticed that the companies that make plant-based uh, meat substitutes have finally hit on a decent, a decent title, plant-based, as opposed to some of the really poor branding it used to use, like gluten nuggets or something like that. But they, but they appeal to people who already don't want to eat meat or they want to cut down on, on the amount of meat they eat. So are those the, is that the same target demographic as the cultured meat would go to? Or it, how would, how would um, companies that produce cultured meat, how will they cross that chasm and get enough of the of the general population, the general consumers to uh, see this as a viable substitute. Because you can bet that the, um, that the industrial agriculture industry is going to work very hard to launch, you know, the, the campaigns of, you know, Franken foods, that's, that's going to be, that's an obvious thing that we're going to see, this scaring people off. So, um, so the, 
the the money that will be thrown at trying to brand and market these will, will be uh, something else. Um, finally, I, I guess I, I'll leave you with um, a question of whether or not we should be revisiting or visiting the idea of some additional regulatory authority, whether it's an additional division of USDA or FDA, or perhaps a standalone agency, um, maybe created by Congress that oversees the animal welfare aspects of both of these technologies. Right now, it doesn't exist. Most of our food law has very little to do, as I said, with the animals while they're still alive. And, um, and so the concerns, especially as they relate to uh, genetically engineered animals, um, really are, are uh, um, quite daunting. And so there needs to be some, some method of, uh, of, there needs to be a voice for animals and, and um, the protection of them, at least to some extent. Um, should we actually approve of larger scale production of genetically engineered animals for food? And so with that, I'll just stop and ask if you have any questions or any ideas or uh, want to share anything uh, about this topic? Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Vesselin. For our um, listeners, our viewers, we have a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. So if you'd like to pose a question, please, um, if you're watching on our website live stream, you can click on watch on live stream that icon at the bottom of the video and that will bring up the chat box where you can add your question or if you're watching on our facebook live stream you would add your question to the comment box below and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible okay first question for you professor what are the perceived human health concerns due to consumption of genetically modified meat perceived or actual um, it, I think the, the question was perceived, right? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So when the, the, the way that the FDA would be go about approving the use of genetically engineered, um, uh, meat from say the gal safe pig, uh, would be to actually test the, the quality, the end product itself, the pork, if you will. Not the not the pig not the not the pig while it's still alive necessarily the the concern is mostly for the end product is it as safe or is it is it safe to be consumed and so it really is all about the consumer's experience or the consumer's health um, and their safety in consuming it not necessarily the safety of the animal now there is some wording in the animal drug section of the FDCA that potentially um, allows for uh, the FDA to look into or require that companies show that the, the process itself is safe for the animals, um, but that has not generally been um, much of a, a, a focus by the FDA up to this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any examples of other countries that have um, done a, their what they've done regulating this type of meat that you think sets an example for what the US should be doing or or perhaps the opposite, what we shouldn't be doing? So Singapore is the only country that I know of so far that's actually approved of the use of, of cultured meat. Um, you know, the EU has gone through an interesting season of litigation It's that's related. I don't know, if, um, perhaps you've seen there have been challenges to uh, plant-based milk and meat products or, or um, meat, meat substitutes. Um, there have been challenges to the, to labeling or advertisements that use the word, say, milk for oat milk or rice milk or soy milk, what have you. And, um, and that's something that we've, we've pretty much already settled 
um, as it pertains to uh, to the same products here in the United States. The consume our, the commercial speech doctrine really allows for that unless there's a unless there's a um, an identifiable cause for confusing the consumer. Um, and that the fact that the EU is dealing with that makes me think that um, that there's a that there's a, a, a that the industry that that animal agriculture industry in Western European countries are mounting more efforts to challenge. This is just a this is my guess. This is my prediction. But I I think that if the EU when the EU starts to try and market um, or or approve of either of these two types of of um, well, if it's cultured meat, that they can expect a serious challenge from um, animal ag. You know, one other thing, this is, I don't know if this is what the, the person was thinking about that asked this question, but in former Soviet bloc countries, uh, like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you know, those that lived under communist rule for uh, decades during the development of some technologies like, say, uh, more advanced landlines for you know telephones, right? So while while we were getting telephones in the you know 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, most people living in those countries, unless you were really wealthy, didn't have a landline um, of, that is a phone, telephone uh, hardwired in their house or apartment. And so when they gained independence, there was really the idea of going introducing that technology didn't make as much sense as instead going for the next thing. And so that's why you see uh, countries like Estonia and, 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 um, and uh, Poland, for example, really excelling in high tech. They've adopted the next technology. So wireless tech, um, uh, they do almost anything over, you know, over their cell phones, right? And I'm, I bring this up because I, I'm thinking about developing countries that are looking to do what Singapore is trying to do. If they don't already have an established, entrenched CAFO system, cultured meat could be an opportunity there to leap ahead of the technology and um, and uh, uh, use the the next you know, take advantage of the bypassing many of the externalities that uh, were that are plaguing us today. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. So um, that'll be, um, you know, we've heard a lot about COVID um, and uh, other pandemics potentially being caused by um, you know, deforestation and loss of habitat causing um, ecosystem disruption and that can lead to animals that are produced for food, contracting um, a disease like COVID and then it passing on to, to um, humans. It's something, you know, that people have been told. Does that, the fact that that's happened with COVID, do you think that makes a difference or have you seen a difference in um, this, you know, artificially grown meat as a result of kind of this moment in time that we're in? You know, I hope that it does have some impact. I think that, I mean, we don't even really know for sure whether or not um, that, that the initial transference to humans of COVID-19 was, or the coronavirus was, although it is a zoonotic, disease that is animals and non-human animals can uh, can contract it or, or um, be infected. It doesn't, we don't know, uh, this is, my understanding is we don't know exactly the source, right? We haven't found that yet. But, you know, what we do know is, is we do know that that swine flu, for example, didn't have the same kind of devastating effects, but uh, was a pretty serious flu back in the early 2000s. And that was a, that absolutely um, was uh, traced to a um, to the hog industry and kind of an interesting to me anyway anecdote. Um, swine flu very rapidly rebranded by the pork industry as H one N one was the the scientists 
essentially, uh, it seems like the majority agree that um, it was first found in Mexico uh, in some um, hog production uh, operations owned by Smithfield. And there is even a little boy who was identified as patient zero, as the one who became the first human sufferer of swine flu or H1N1. And this little town in Mexico has a statue of him uh, in their downtown plaza, in their in their, the middle of the town as, as hopefully a tourist attraction. Uh, so my answer to that is not yet. And I wish that it would. We have such short memories, but, um, but the connection between um, mass animal confinement and genetic conformity and and um, and the the rise of of uh, antibiotic resistance and um, and the spread of of uh, zoonotic uh, diseases is it's undeniable, right? You know, I guess the question is, what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to risk in order to have cheap meat and dairy? Thank you. Seems like a good, a good, uh, a good question to end on. Though we know, we know there's there's not an easy answer. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Bessel, and that was a really interesting talk. Um, I want to thank our viewers for joining us today as well. And our next hot topics talk will be here on June twenty fourth, again at noon Eastern. And we hope you can join us then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.